We just finished with the quality constrained SQP, and now we're in a position to add in those inequality constraints. Just by way of review, remember that we could have um, any equality constraint optimization problem. Um, and what we could do is that we could uh, look at the KKT conditions, right? We, well, good thing at this way, we just take the derivatives of that, set them equal to zero, um, and we just get a set of equations. They may be nonlinear, but you know, they're a set of equations, so we may have to do something like Newton's method. That's not too bad, just a system of equations. We'll find that for the inequality constraints, it uh, can be quite a bit more complicated to solve. So let's start again with a motivating problem, just a simple 2D problem to kind of think through some of the basic mechanics before we do it a little more generally. And so if you were in class, this is the same problem we did. If you weren't, you should try this exercise, but I'm gonna go through it here as well to highlight some of the points. So uh, let's see, x2 minus 2x1, and then one minus x1 minus x2. Okay, so the hint I'll give you, if you haven't done this yet, is that um, if we change our inequality constraints to equality constraints, then we can use the same machinery as before. You'll remember we did this once when we were looking at the KKT conditions, we introduced these slack variables. And so that's the same idea we're gonna use here. Um, so let's take this uh, first constraint, x2 minus 2x1. I want it to be an equality constraint. Uh, you know, I could potentially just say, let's say it's equal to this, not this variable that I'm gonna add. I like, remember when we went from equality to unconstrained, we had to add variables to make that happen in the Lagrangian. Same here, we're adding variables. But if I did that, then I'd have to say, okay, well, I add an additional constraint too. But that didn't really get me anywhere because now I've got another inequality constraint. So. Um, the trick we use is that we square S1, put a minus sign. Now S1 is unconstrained because whatever S1 I put in here, you know, uh, it can be, it's free to move it. There's, there's nothing that it couldn't be because it's gonna be less than or equal to zero. Um, it of course has a solution. It's not any number is the solution. It's just that I don't have to add any additional constraints. Um, another way you could think about this, if I wrote it in our standard form, is you could say, well, there is some solution for x1 and x2, right? Some optimal solution. And if I plug them in here, I'm going to get some number, which generally be negative. It could be zero, but generally negative. And I just need the optimizer to add whatever number it needs to over here to make this zero. So I want the optimizer to figure that out too, right? As it's solving these, just figure out, just add, you know, here's a variable you can use. Just do it so that this thing equals zero. It's just going to take up the slack, the slack variable. So for the second constraint, we do the same thing. It's gonna be equal to some variable we need to solve for that's negative um, or in our standard form. And S1 and S2 are different, right? I need one for each constraint because uh, you know, in general, whatever this evaluates to is not gonna be the same as whatever that evaluates to. Okay, so now I've got an objective and equality constraints. I can do what we did last time, I can form a Lagrangian. It's gonna be F, X1 squared minus X2, plus lambda one. And notice that I'm gonna have two lambdas now because I've got two constraints. X2 minus two X1 plus S1 squared plus lambda two. Now the second constraint, one minus X1 minus X2 plus S2 squared. All right. So now I've changed this into an unconstrained problem. Uh, and how many variables do I have? I've got six, x1, x2, lambda one, lambda two, s1, s2. So like before, I take partial derivatives, set them equal to zero, I have six equations, six unknowns. So far, so good. Okay, so I didn't really wanna do all that here on the fly, so I'm just gonna show you what that looks like. Took the partial with respect to x1, to x2, lambda one, lambda two, s1, s2, and then here at the bottom, I wrote the K, these are from our KKT conditions. Remember we talked about from uh, when we discussed inequality constraints, we showed that because uh, my constraint vector had to be anti-parallel to a linear combination of the, uh, or sorry, my objective had to be anti-parallel to a linear combination of the constraint gradients. We showed Lambda had to be positive. If they were negative, then there were tons of step directions that we could have improved in. Uh, 
Uh, so we weren't at an optimum. So this must be true for this to be an optimum. There's actually a two here when you do the derivatives. I just dropped it because you know it's equal to zero on the other side, so it doesn't matter. Okay, so great. Six equations, six unknowns. But we have a problem. Can you spot the problem? So these here are our complementarity conditions, also known as complementary slackness conditions. Uh, and I can't solve them directly, right? I mean, the problem is this. All this equation tells me is that either lambda one is zero or S one is zero. I mean, potentially both are zero, but that's not possible given the definitions we'll see in a sec. And this one just tells me lambda two is zero or S two is zero, but there's nothing I can do here to like solve that, right? It just tells me it's an either or. Let's just recall again what this means. What does it mean if S1 is zero? This is that first constraint, for example. If S1 is zero, or we can go back to here and look at it, I guess. If S1 is zero, that means this constraint, right, is active, right? It's X2 minus two X1 equals zero. It's an active constraint, okay? So if S1 is zero, that means my first constraint is active. What does it mean when lambda one is zero? If you may remember when we talked about uh, the KQT conditions, we saw that lambda equals zero occurs if the constraint is inactive. So all this constraint really tells me is that constraint one is either inactive or it's active, and constraint two is inactive or it's active. Not really super helpful actually. So this doesn't really tell me anything. So effectively I've got four equations and six unknowns and some additional criteria. Okay, well, what I could do then is I could just, um, well, I know constraint one is active or inactive, constraint two is active or inactive. I've got four possibilities. Either they're both inactive, one's active, two's inactive, or two's active and two's, sorry, one's active, two's inactive, or they're both, whatever the one I didn't say is, inactive, I guess. Anyway, four possibilities here. I could try them all. Okay, see what happens. So let's do that. Uh, and by the way, this is what this will look like. So if I take the remaining equations, these four that I actually have with these six unknowns, so I, I'm gonna have to pick something, right? So let's say I choose lambda one equals, whoops, let's say I choose constraint one is inactive, constraint two uh, is active, for example. Then, then I know two variables here, this one and this one I could, remove them and have four unknowns and four equations, right? And I'd also, of course, have to take out the corresponding columns. But that's what we're gonna do. Okay, so we'll just try all four different options here. Um, so let's try the first one where they're both inactive. If lambda one equals zero and lambda two equals zero, what happens is uh, we can actually see it um, here, this equation here, oops. Imagine both those are zero, zero, zero. So this says minus one equals zero. Not true, so uh, that can't be a solution. Okay, let's say they're both active. S1 is zero, S2 is zero. So then we get um, a four by four. I'll just show this one one, this one. Okay, so if I take S1 and S2 equals zero, the variables I have remaining are X1, X2, lambda one, lambda two, and the equations I have remaining, two, zero, minus two, minus one, zero, zero, one, minus one, and then the others. I'm not gonna fill it all out here. Okay, and I, I can solve it and I get the following. X one equals a third, X two equals two thirds, lambda one equals five ninths, lambda two equals minus four ninths. Okay, is that a good solution? It's not, right? Because remember, we said that Lagrange multipliers for this to be a solution of the KKT conditions have to be non-negative, right? They have to be greater than or equal to zero. This is negative, so this is not a possible solution. Okay, uh, whoops, let's stay on that page. So I got some room. Let's say uh, constraint one is active, or sorry, is inactive. Constraint two, obviously I'm gonna save the last one. Well, this actual solution for the last. So constraint two is active. If we do that, what's gonna happen is the same thing. Um, this, this Lagrange multiplier here ends up being negative. Actually, no, that one's zero, right? This Lagrange multiplier, lambda two, is gonna be negative. So it's not a solution. So finally, we check the last case. 
S1 is zero, lambda two equals zero, and I get a solution. X1 equals one, X2 equals two, lambda one equals one, and then the slack variable squared thing here equals two. Okay, so both my Lagrange multipliers are greater than or equal to zero, so this is a solution. This says that constraint one is active, constraint two inactive. And this is a picture of that. Here's the solution at one, two. And you can't tell from the picture, I guess, probably which one is one and two, but we can see that one of the constraints was active. In this case, that would be um, constraint uh, one, right? Yeah, I think that's the one we said. Yeah, constraint one was active. Okay, so, uh, you know, uh, I know I went through that a little fast because I just want to get the main idea across and be worth it. Uh, might be worth it for you to work that out in a little more detail on your own. Um, so what's the big challenge? We solved the problem. Um, but if you notice the method we use is unsustainable, it's fine for the small problem. Because what did we do? We got to this point, which is gonna happen every time, and you're gonna have some system of equations, but then you're gonna have all these complementary slackness conditions and they don't really tell you anything. Um, and so we tried every combination. Now with two variables, two to the two is only four, but uh, that's gonna grow exponentially. So let's say I've got 10 constraints, that's a thousand combinations. 20 constraints, I'm at a million combinations. 30 constraints, it's over a billion. So, uh, you know, that's obviously growing crazily uh, and it's intractable. So uh, there are two general approaches here. Um, I mean, there's some variations, lots of variations actually, but uh, two main approaches here to deal with this. This is, a, this is a combinatorial problem we can't solve. And this is what makes it harder than the equality constraint. Because the equality constraint, every time we're just gonna get a system of equations, n equations and unknowns, as long as we you know, have, uh, yeah, anyway. So we could solve that. In this case though, we have less equations than unknowns because a lot of them are just these complementary slackness things. So we have to try a whole bunch of combinations. One of the approaches is called uh, using active set. Um, and this is usually done with SQP, right? So active set sometimes says SQP or S active set SQP. Um, and the idea of an active set method is that uh, let's say we knew, of course we don't, but we knew which constraints were going to be active at the end of the solution and which ones weren't. So let's say if I went back to this problem, oh, I guess I went before. Um, I knew that constraint one was active and I knew constraint two was inactive. Well, if I knew that, I could say, let's get rid of all these inactive constraints, just delete them, they're not doing anything. And all these inactive ones, turn them into equality constraints because they're active. So equality is gonna be exactly the same. Now I have an equality constraint optimization problem and I already know how to solve that. Right? It's just gonna give me a system of equations. Okay, so the idea with the active set methods is to say, okay, well, we don't know the active set, but we could uh, try to estimate it in the same way we try to estimate a Hessian or not in the same way, but in that same kind of idea that we could approximate it as we iterate. We're gonna gain new information during each iteration and we're gonna use that to update our estimate of what the active set is. So in other words, at each iteration, we're not gonna deal with this huge problem with tons and tons of constraints. We're gonna deal with a small number of constraints, the ones that we think are gonna be active, okay? Um, there's another method, you know, there's these interior point methods. Talk a little bit about those next time. Um, these ones are going to not deal with a combinatorial problem either. They're going to force feasibility. Um, and they're actually not going to force feasibility on the constraints per se, but rather on that slackness. They're going to make sure those, those, those slack variables are always feasible. Um, we'll get a little more detail later, but for now, well, let's, uh, we're gonna discuss this. I'm actually not gonna discuss this in too much detail. I'm just trying to give you the big picture. Um, I just wrote a new section in, in the book. You'll have to re-download it if you're interested um, in details about how this could be done. Um, but uh, I just wanna give you the kind of the bigger picture here. So the idea is that before, remember, remember how the idea with SQP is that at each iteration we'd solve a QP. And before it'd be a QP like this, one half, uh, 
plus. I'm just writing a generic one. These are really like um, Hessians of the Lagrangian. Okay, and this, so this would be a my Lagrangian. I'd have a second, second order approximation of my Lagrangian. And then my equality constraints, right? I'd have something like this, ax plus b equals zero. And that's what I had before. And those were easy to solve. But now uh, my, uh, I have to approximate my inequality constraints. So I might have something like this now. I'm gonna take a linear approximation of my inequality constraints. The general problem is really hard. So here is the general problem. Minimize f, h equals zero, g is less than or equal to zero. And what we're doing is saying, let's take this general function, approximate as a quadratic. Well, actually the Lagrangian is quadratic. Let's approximate my equality constraints as um, linear and we'll approximate my inequality constraints as linear. So this is, should at least nearby be a pretty good representation. And I do that by you know, computing the function gradient, the Hessian of my objective and constraints to form this approximation. But uh, this part, right, the equality part, we saw that was a really easy problem to solve. With the inequality constraint, it's a bit harder. And this is where we're gonna use the active set idea. Um, if we, if we can approximate or guess, or sorry, update an approximation of what the active set's gonna be, then we can turn the ones that are active into equality constraints, solve the QP really easy, and we'll see, does that actually satisfy the conditions? If not, we update our estimate of the active set and we iterate a little bit until we solve this problem. Again, there's some details in the text about how to solve um, uh, an inequality constraint QP if you're interested. But from our takeaway, the idea is that we, we have this really hard problem to solve, we're gonna reduce it now to this uh, simpler problem that we're gonna solve iteratively. This problem is still a little tricky, right? Cause we have to do the whole active set thing here, but it's just a QP. It's something that uh, once we approximate these equality constraints, we could solve it exactly and really quickly. And we just have to make sure that that guess, the active constraints is correct, right? So we'll iterate on that. Okay, so that's the idea. So this is called sequential quadratic programming because again, this is a QP, quadratic objective linear constraints. And we're gonna sequentially solve that QP until we come to the solution for this general problem. All right, uh, so that's gonna be it for SQP. Like I said, if you go look at, uh, well, I didn't say this, but if you go look at algorithms uh, options, sometimes you'll see it written as SQP, sometimes you'll see it as active set. Um, there are many variations of this, uh, but the same kind of general idea of sequentially using a, a simpler, optimization problem, usually a QP. Um, sometimes you'll see a linear objective, linear constraints, but usually a QP. All right, so next time we'll talk a little bit about uh, um, barrier functions and, and interior point methods.